Today we're going to be looking at the locks and keys, the global cycle locks and keys, and how we're going to be looking at the lock of gate 46, the temple. And the, the temple is really where we go to worship. Uh, gate 46 typically would mean the body, right? The body is the, the ultimate temple. Just as 25 is the, the blood, um, 46 is kind of the chalice, you could say, of what holds the blood. Uh, but being the temple, it takes on a different quality for the global cycles. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to be reading Gate 40, talking about Gate 40, what Gate 40 has given us in this time, um, the current time, if you're watching before 2027, of the Cross of the Planning, uh, you know, the Incarnation Cross of Planning, and then how that is giving way to the Cross of the Sleeping Phoenix and what it means for 40 to change to 59. So I, I know, you know, when you get into global psychoanalysis, you really have to be familiar with 24 different gates to make sense of it. So you have to be familiar with a good third, with over a third of the gates. So it's hard to do this level of analysis. You know, we're looking at the lock, gate 46, and then how the key, gate 40, changes to the key, gate 59. So we have to be able to, to deconstruct these things and understand them in terms of the totality and in terms of the global cycles and not just in terms of ourself. So gate 46, the temple, this is where we go to worship. This is our church. This is our holiest of holies. This is where we commune. And gate 40 is the gate of aloneness. So this tells us right away that since 1615, that is from 1615 to 2026, the temple has been aloneness. And this isn't a bargain with gate 37, right? Gate 37 says, I'll give you the affection if you have the capacity to provide for me. And gate 40 says, sure, I'll do it, but you better give me my free time too. You know, I, I get a certain amount of time off also. This is the nine to five work week. This is, the temple has been in gate 40. Let's just read a little bit about gate 40 here. I have the uh, blue I Ching available for free from 64 keys. A lot of people don't like the blue I Ching, but I'm just gonna give it a try this time. So they call gate 40 determination. The original name in the I Ching is deliverance. And the Ray V Ching calls it the gate of aloneness. Here's how 64 Keys describes it. This specialization has a lot to do with living and working together in a community. Harmony, oh, I see, it's the channel. They're talking about the whole channel. Harmony, fairness, and balance of job and family. Like-minded allies, right communities, contracts, deals, rules of the game. Yeah, so this is one of the themes. We saw this looking at the gate, at gate 37 as well. Yeah, and if you have gate 40 and you don't have a defined ego, um, you know, or if you don't have gate 40, you're really not here to love work. I get this a lot from generators who say, well, I'm a generator, I don't love my work. I say, well, do you have gate 40? If not, you're probably never going to love your work. You may still sacredly respond to doing it, but you might not love it. So 40 is the love of work. So here they're saying uh, 40, some extra keynotes, a gate of aloneness along with 33 and 12 the gate of the love for work, the stomach, and the gate of masturbation slash independence. Part of the awareness stream of sensitivity from the 1949. So, yeah, and they have their own names for, um, so I'll just read the, the name for the line one, which is the line we've been in since 1960. They call it relaxation, enjoying the fruits of one's labor the ability to relax and enjoy the fruits of one's labor alone, or the ego getting uncomfortable with being alone too long. Yeah, so I, I'm now gonna jump over to what Ra has to say about it in the Ray V. Chain Line Companion. Hexagram 40, Deliverance. The heart center and the self are of enormous, enormous significance to us. The G center and the heart center are part of the most basic and primary infrastructure that is built within us. They both represent qualities that are often deeply confused, the relationship between the self and the I. That's really, that's something really beautiful there. I mean, Carl Jung is probably the first that I 
been familiar with distinguishing between the capital S self and the I, the me, the ego. And that's exactly what Ra is doing here. He's saying the capital S self as contrasted with the I. So the G center is the self. That's like the greater psychic totality of us. That's the bigger, the bigger thing, right? And then the ego is the I. And looking at the ego gates and the gates of the G, we're going to distinguish very clearly between the natures of these two. In dealing with the ego, a picture of the tribal circuitry gives an impression of the importance of the heart center and the ego in our mundane lives. This is absolutely essential. That's why we have civilizations and cultures. Friendship. It's always caught up in the ego and how great they are or have been. Oh, we're such great friends or what a great civilization we've had or, and so on. Ego is intrinsic to the nature of what the tribe is all about. Everything about tribal circuitry is rooted in the ego. The 51 uh, is also tribal, even though it's deeply individual. As part of individual circuitry, it serves the tribe. It's directly connected to the tribe. The way in which we're going to look at the heart center is through its two primary functions. Willpower in the 40th gate, leading to the 51st gate. That's from the um, mystical way, for those familiar with that and the ego or possessiveness of the I in the 26th gate leading to the 21st gate. I see, so they, there really is a crossover here. What he's saying is that gate 26 leads up to the 21, eventually to the 45. Gate uh, 40 leads over to the 51 and eventually over to the 25. The heart center is very complex. It's obviously misunderstood. Egoism is something that's put down in the Eastern side of the world, the quality of the I and its possessiveness. When you're looking at the ego, you're looking at the biological complexity that's unlike any other center that we have. Willpower begins with the stomach, part of the heart center, like the heart muscle itself, which is the 21st gate, or the gallbladder in the 51st gate, or the thymus in the T cells of the 26th gate. So it's a complex center here. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's including the stomach, the physical heart itself, the gallbladder, and the thymus and T cells in the immune system. All of this is in this one center. The stomach and the heart give you a deep insight into the nature of how the ego works. The ego, the will, can never work consistently. It's very important to grasp that willpower can only last so long under certain circumstances that it has to give up. The same way your heart needs to beat. It can't hold the tone. There has to be the space in between. The tension, the relaxation. The same thing is true for the stomach. You cannot feed the stomach all day. The stomach needs to have its time of rest and its time of work. In understanding the nature of the ego, it's important to see that it's always looking for rest. There's something about the ego that's really not understood. It's not looking to go out and shine or send out its willpower. It's looking to rest until there is exactly the right timing to release that energy so that the release of that energy is productive because the ego itself knows that it can only be active so long. In other words, unless you really have the will, you are not able to climb that mountain. So this is a good point. As an undefined ego, learning about what it really means to rest, learning about what it really means to work once and get the reward forever, you know, learning what it means to invest wisely in your future, learning what it means to... Yeah, like, I don't necessarily have something in me that, that will do that, right? I have this undefined ego... So I start as a complete fool, and I have to learn. I have to learn. Now, we can see also that, um, just because, you know, we're trying to read this in the context of the global cycles, that this is a tremendous large-scale program to make sure people get fed. 4037 is like all the foreign aid, all of the Red Cross, all of the Doctors Without Borders, all of the health care, all of the, you know, so-called welfare state, and so on. That is here to provide. I mean, it's the channel of communism, actually. It's one of its nicknames. And, and to make sure people get fed. And to create the bargain between the rest and the work. Yeah, you can rest, but you also have to work. Well, yeah, you can work, but you also have to rest. The ego recognizes that it must have the resources, and at the same time, in order to get there, it knows that it has to rest. This makes the will something that's not easy for others because it's unlike any of the other motors. When you turn on the generator, you turn it on for life until death. Frequency after frequency, on and on and on. When you turn on the emotional system, you have a lifelong wave. When you turn on the adrenaline system, the pressure never goes away. It's constant. 
The thing about the ego is that it works and then it goes on vacation. This is the nature of the ego. The ego, may, uh, this is from the white book, a will or lack of will to provide for the needy. This is the role of the 40th gate. Deliverance has several meanings. Jesus delivered people from their sins. To be delivered is almost equivalent to being brought to satori or enlightenment. To be delivered from evil is in the Lord's Prayer. Deliverance carries with it a substantial value as a mundane process. To be the one that delivers is synonymous with being a breadwinner. If you deliver, you bring home the goods so everybody can eat. Deliverance also has a high mystical and spiritual value to it. The very name of this gate is what is really demanded of the ego. The tribe needs the ego to express its power. Willpower is something that does not operate in a fixed pattern. Yeah, it's um, on and off, and it's feast or famine. Yeah. All of us know that by the way we eat. You can be regular in your eating, but you can also have all kinds of variations that run in between. Only when the ego system builds up its proper readiness is it going to use that willpower. When the willpower is there, its purpose is to provide for those who need. The byproduct of that is that the deliverer may in fact do well themselves. The thing that drives the ego is the need of those who call upon it. The classic nature of the 4037, the channel of community, the marriage contract. The reality is that the 40 is expected to deliver. The 40 and its ego is expected to go out there in the world and conquer the material plane. In return, it will have its ego massaged. So this is a huge part of our programming, our temple now. Go out and worship in the temple of conquering the material plane. Go out and be a breadwinner. Make it for yourself. Go out and deliver. And also, the temple of aloneness. I've worked so hard, I get to now sit at home and watch my TV show. I get to sit in my aloneness. I get to have my big house where every member of the family gets to be alone. This is not something that, you know, was possible in the past. But starting in 1615, the possibility emerged of really being alone, of having the reward of being alone. The whole thing to understand about the 40th gate is that it is not the big powerful will. We find the strong will in the 51st gate. Rather, the 40 is the potential of will that can be built up or inflated by others. The ego is lazy and wants to rest. Yes, I can do it, but please, I need my rest first. Before the ego gets going, it has to have something on the other side that says, you are really wonderful. Or, there's nothing in the refrigerator and you have to go out and do something about it. The fact is, the ego needs to be worked on. If it does not get worked on, if it does not get massaged or pumped up, it just says, sorry, I'm tired and don't feel like doing it. I'll just sit here. That's what it is. This is what is felt as laziness by the undefined ego. I've seen a lot of defined egos that I feel like the only place I really put laziness in the chart. Now, it's not to say the undefined ego can't be lazy. They can be, anyone can be lazy, right? But when people say that person's lazy, they don't want to work. It's typically the defined ego that hasn't been massaged enough. It hasn't been, you know, it says, I'm too tired today. I don't feel like doing it today. I'm not going to do it today. Try again tomorrow. And it resists and it, it, it can't, it's not at will. It's funny because you would think it's at will, right? It's the willpower center. You would think it's available at will. But even willpower is at the mercy of the flows of energy. Above the lines, the key to everything about the 40th gate, this is the blue line, the point of transition between struggle and liberation. This is the whole business of understanding the ego. It has its time for struggle, then it has its required liberation to be free from struggle. No ego can stay with struggle. Something to, important to understand, you can only push will so far. So this is just, yeah, just kind of getting the context of the ego. Of course, we're looking at it in the global cycle context, and we're looking at it in the context of the temple. This is uh, where we worship. You know, our, our worship, our church is the ego. Our church is individuality. In some sense, in 1615, this individuality, this I am, right, that wants to be lazy, that wants to be puffed up and all this stuff, this has been where we worship. This has been a key theme of our society that we just take for granted. But it wasn't there before, it's not going to be there in the future. Or if you're watching this video after 2027, it's not there anymore. The first line of Gate 40, recuperation. This is what they called relaxation in the, in the gene key, not the gene keys, but the 64 keys, rather. Recuperation. When we get to the beginning of the hexagram structure, we begin with the first line in the lower trigram. The lower trigram does not know there's anything else at the other end of the channel. So they're not social and are quite surprised, even if it's a social channel, 
And this is the channel of the social marriage contract. But the first three lines are not socially gifted. They're only interested in the foundations. They themselves tend to be invisible. They're the kind of ego you can't find them to tell them the refrigerator's empty. They're out in the backyard having a snooze. They don't want to have anything to do with that. And while they're lying there, they're trying to figure out if willpower is something of value in the first place. This is what's so funny. The first line will spend 25 years just trying to figure out what something is. People say, well, what's it like being a first line in a relationship? I say, well, it takes 25 years to figure out if you can trust that person. What's it like being a, you know, you, you look at a gate like a six and it's all about intimacy or 59, you know? And you look at these, you look at the first line, and the first line says, well, what is intimacy really? How do we really know? Let's get to the bottom of it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's or we're going to be looking at, you know, uh, we'll be looking at 59 momentarily, and it's really looking at what are the fundamentals of these? I mean, this is Ross' joke. It's like, you get 40, well, 40 is all about doing that hard work and going out there and being the bread, the, you know, breadwinner, delivering on the marriage contract, living up to your end of the bargain. What's the first line doing? They're going, well, what is a bargain really? Let's think about it. And let's get to the basics. Like, what's the, what's the fundamental bargain here? And how do we know that that's the basic bargain? How do we know we start there? Why don't we start somewhere else? Let's look where other people started. Let's look at the masters who came before us. Maybe we can learn from them. I mean, it's doing one thing after the next to investigate the foundation. It doesn't really have anything to do with all the people saying, we need food in the fridge. So it's really funny when you see how the first line plays out in these different, these different gates, these different positions. So the ego must have its rest. When you give the ego its rest, everything works. The first line is recuperation. It's what the ego requires. It can only be used for so long that it must recuperate. Any kind of long-term relationship of couples where the man comes home from work and he throws himself on the sofa and turns on the TV and blares out his brain, and there's a whole list of things he could be doing, but you can't ask him. If you do that, it will create problems because that willpower is also ego. Don't bother me now. The ability to relax and enjoy the fruits of one's labor. Ross says when he sees people with this line, he reminds them of one thing. Your friends are only of value to, to you as long as they don't take you aside and say, excuse me, you really have a problem. For this kind of person, friendship is not having people tell them they have a problem their willpower has to deal with that they have to go out and do something about. They just want to be able to relax. They will do their work if you let them relax. So that's what the 41 means, if you, the gate 40 line one. And this is really, this has been our key. This is where we are right now in the world where we are all in recuperation. But on the other side of it, the detriment is the moon and uh, the whole thing about the 40th gate, although it requires its rest, it cannot just rest. If it rests when it comes home from work, it has to get up the next day and go out into the world. So, yeah, it's, it's, so the detriment is too many changes, you know, changes in the family, changes in the, and also it's, it's a certain discomfort with being alone. For the stomach, it's very important for any human being to understand the nature of nutrition. You can't eat if you're not hungry any more than willpower can be used if it's not the right time. And the person who has the capacity does not want to be involved. This is devastating. It's extremely healthy and creates what people call ulcers. All kinds of difficulties with the physical stomach itself. So ulcers are coming from forcing yourself to eat when you don't want to and or using willpower when you don't have the capacity or when you do have the capacity but you do not want to be involved in that. In the White Book, the ego strength to enjoy being alone. The 40th gate says, I don't need you. But this is not true. The 40th gate and the 26th gate are the gates of denial. It's in their mechanism to say, don't bother me now. I mean, here's another big global theme we have, the theme of denial. All the climate denial, all of the denial of the world changing, the denial of mass extinction, the denial of so many things is powered by the 40. We worship at the church of denial, right? This is the gate of denial and it's our church. It's in the mechanism to say, don't bother me now. In order to get the ego to do anything, you have to massage it. This is why this don't bother me is not true. Otherwise, it will say, I will stay alone. And the other says, no, you can't. We need you. We have to have you. You're so important to us. They have to be pulled into the game. 
I got out, but they pulled me back in. <laughs> the other side is the ego uncomfortable with being alone too long. After the 40th gate had its rest, it says, why isn't there anybody around being nice to me and asking me to go to work? And who needs me after all? Why doesn't somebody need me? So they're ready to look for somebody who will need them. So their ego can be puffed up and then go back and say, don't bother me now, I'm getting my rest. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is our time since you know the early 1960s, we've seen this emerge. Now, of course, it's been since 1615, over 400 years that we've actually had gate 40. I'm just talking about gate 40 line one. So what is this changing to? If we're changing out of the 40, you know, if this is going away, if our old church was we got to go home from work and we get to have our aloneness, and that's the bargain. We get to have the nine to five work week. I mean, I know there was a period during this time where there was 24 hours, 365, you know, kind of working. In the 1800s, in the Industrial Revolution, they were putting two shifts, you know, a 12-hour shift in the day, a 12-hour shift at night. But over time, what did emerge was this balance of some sort and this push for fairness. Remember, fairness is also part of this. Fairness is part of it and also prove it to me is part of it. You know, be reasonable. And um, so now we're, we're moving to hexagram 59. So this is going to be the new church. So this is really interesting. We're moving out of the church of aloneness into the church of the sexual hustler, the church of dispersion, the church of orgasm. Okay, let's see what Ra has to say about it. Hexagram 59. 59 conditions so much of our behavior. There's six different gates that are roll gates. There's four roll gates in the G center, the 13, 1, 7, and 10, and then two roll gates coming out of the sacral. 59 is one of them. And this center acts as our genetic roll generator. It's important to understand that genetic roles are what's necessary to satisfy the genetic need. Nothing to do with the essence of the person, of their mind, or their feelings. It's simply the genetic imperative. As you'll see, when we're looking at both the 59th gate and the 27th gate, which are the two sacral uh, role gates, we're looking at genetic strategies. They do not describe the person. They describe a role. So when we say it's a sexual hustler, I'm not saying this person has the personality of a sexual hustler. This is the role, the, per the person to convince the others to have sex so the genetic imperative can be fulfilled so that, you know, the uh, gene pool goes on. And so the species survives. They do not describe the person, they describe a role. It's important to keep in mind when you're looking at role gates. Role gates never describe the person. These two gates out of the sacral connect on either side to mechanisms that have a deep impact on our lives. The waves and the frequency upon us, the sixth gate in the solar plexus, which generates the emotional wave, six different archetypes of the emotional wave. And then on the other side, the 50th gate and the spleen generating six different awareness frequencies. And the waves and frequencies operate through the lines. And because of that, the wave that exists in the first line is going to be something that has a resonance to all other first and fourth lines. And so when you look at the different lines, um, you know, you, you can see this, these resonances. The thing to recognize about that is these roles have a resonance. Every first line which sets the foundation and introspective resonates to the role of pursuer-pursuit. Every second line, shyness, boldness. The third line, bonds made and broken, and so on. The confidant or not, about friendship. The fifth line is the role of the seducer and the seduced. And you get to the sixth line, and you get to the soulmate or not, and the theme of all six lines. If it's not going to be the most wonderful thing in the world, why bother? When you look at the lines of the 59th gate, keep in mind underneath these lie quintessential roles, and they are strategy roles. Understand the nature of strategy. If you have someone who has the fourth line, strategy genetically is you're going to be restricted in your role to making friends with somebody before you can ever have a chance to make love with them. Not only that, or not only is it saying that there will, that will be the strategy, what it's saying is if you go through that process and first make friends and finally become their lover, the child you can produce is the right genetic combination because it's a genetic strategy. It's not that the person themselves like that. Lots of people have the 59-4. They're complaining about how it's impossible for them to have a one-night stand. It's impossible for them to meet somebody and just dissolve into a relationship. They have to go through this process first. They have to be friends first. They have to hear about their lovers, hear about their problems. You have to go through all that crap before you finally get to the point of, okay, it's our turn now. It's just a strategy. It's not the being. Do not confuse roles with the being. What happens to us is that most of us who produce children look around at the person who produces children with and say, why? <laughs> That's scary. 
The reality is that's what the genetics demand. The genetics said that was necessary to produce a viable genetic mix for the next generation. And what, that, what they say, what the genetics say, may not be what your mind likes, it may not be what your heart likes, and it may not be what your identity likes. But through resonance, you can see how you can work those things out. In relationships, by knowing how to meet people through the resonance. It's another story entirely, but these six roles underlie the 59th hexagram. It's ultimately about the ability to break down barriers in order to achieve union. Every single one of these roles is designed to break down barriers. Genetic strategies, they know exactly how to work. They have the ability to break down barriers, and that's what they're there for. So, 59, of course, starts in line one, but we're starting in line six, because that's what we're going into in 2027, or if you're watching this post 2027, that's what we're already in for the next 70 years until, you know, 2097 or something. When we come to the sixth line, the line of transition, we come to the end of the process. Well, they're talking about the process from the other direction. The line is called the one night stand. This line is deeply misunderstood. The one night stand is clearly the resonance to bonds made and broken of the third line. So there's always the potential for this kind of sexuality. It's the resonance. But all six lines have within them the sense of soulmate or not. It's about, yes, I know how to do it. I know I can do it. I know I can do it with you, but so what? Where is that going to take me? Where am I going to go with all that? The sixth line is always looking at the complete circuit. When you take a look at the circuitry, you're basically looking at what it is to be a member of the tribe. Then the sixth stands back and says, wait a minute, I know what this is all about. This is children, houses, mortgages, the job, the neighborhood, the friends my kid has to have, the government that runs the city, and you want me to get involved with you tonight and I have to think about all of that? The black book has the blue line, the tendency based on personality or circumstances to accept only temporary unions that may otherwise be impossible or dangerous to continue. Because it's not going to lead anywhere the sixth line wants to go. It wants to go to the 45th gate that says, I have, I want. I have what I need. If it cannot say that it's not going, if it can't say that it has what it needs, it's not going to want to be involved at all. So this is because it's looking at the whole circuit group, right? The sixth line, looking at the whole thing. The power for intimacy regardless of conditions. The power is always there, but that does not mean it will be used. Or the detriment, a drive for sexual and intimate diversity. If you meet a 59.6 and watch them in a cafe, you see what it means. They're watching everything that moves, every muscle, every tone, every shape. It's not that they do anything about it, but they're looking at everything and think, eh, maybe. So don't be carried away with this. You see somebody who's driven by their sexuality to step into union. That's not what it's about. They know all that stuff, but there's a much deeper sense of what else is there. It's the sixth line. The next line, going, going the normal direction, is the 41, the 40.1. You move deep into the tribe, the part of the tribe that has to work it all out, that has to provide the ego energy to support the family and make the marriage bargain and all these things. The thing the 59.6 knows is the next step, God forbid, says the 59.6, is the 40.1. The moment I make this step, I'll have to play out the whole movie starting at the 40th hexagram. They're not going to do that unless they see something that's unusual for them, the soulmate or not. By the way, in terms of resonance, if you see someone who has a 59.6, there's many third lines, they're more likely to experiment earlier in their life with all kinds of short-term relationships until they get to the point where they realize, oh, I have to wait. Resonance has a lot to do with how we function and where the resonance is to these things. Okay, so Ra's been talking more specifically in a very particular way, you know, in a personal chart. But what does this mean for the temple to be the one night stand? I mean, are we going to see the kind of surface interpretation is that there's a real breakdown of marriage, the loss of marriage, typified by gate 40. We're leaving that, and then we're going into the dissolution of marriage, and we're going into simultaneously... I won't be involved unless it's perfect, and since I'm not going to be involved, I might as well, at least with the third line resonance, just have a diversity of sexual and intimate encounters. That is the um, detriment. So the bad side of the 59.6 is coming out as saying, so the good side of it is the willingness to actually bond no matter if the world's falling apart. See, you know, 59.6 is like, you fall in love while the Titanic's sinking and you'd rather make love on the sinking Titanic or whatever, you know. 
that's 59.6, because you really are with your soulmate. When 59.6 does have that soulmate and says, wow, this is something really special, this is so unique, this is so different, that's when nothing else matters. The circumstances don't matter. So the exaltation of 59.6 is the ability to be intimate with somebody, the ability to sexually bond with somebody, despite being in a war-torn country, despite having no money, despite what craziness might happen tomorrow, despite the world falling apart, and on and on and on. Uh, the detriment, though, is really this, because it's not perfect, I'm just only going to have sexual intimate diversity. That's it. Just diversity. Never committing to, to the one side of it. So I think we can see this as the temple. I mean, on the one hand, the temple, it's interesting to think, as sexual values and family values break down, are we going to see more hookup culture? We've, or are we just going to see more asexuality all around? We have gate 34, which is the sacral gate of asexuality, uh, you know, also coming in, into the picture. And we can talk about that in a, in a different episode. But, you know, it's, it's hard to really know what this is going to look like. The line is called the one night stand. So you might think, okay, breakdown of the marriage contract. In the future, people are going to take intimacy where they can get it. And there's not going to be any commitment behind it. They're simply going to say, I like you, you like me, we've come together and bond, and then go our separate ways. On the other hand, there will be that real potential, as with all six lines, for perfection and for true love and for that, that role model, uh, soulmate bonding, you know, that kind of idealized bonding. And the way it's going to happen is through that exaltation, which is fundamentally about being able to bond despite the circumstances. And that is going to be our new church. Our church is moving away from aloneness and moving into intimacy of some kind. It's interesting. That's going to be what's going to be more valuable. Being alone is not going to be as valuable. See, in, in, currently right now, being alone is very valuable. I got a big house so I can be alone. I work hard so I can be alone. I have this TV room so I can be alone and close the door and shut myself out from my family. I'm not talking about me personally. I'm just kind of trying to exemplify the times, you know. And that's a huge part of what our current time is, the reward of being alone. But that's going away. It's not going to be seen as rewarding. That key is not going to open any doors anymore. The locks change. Or rather, the locks stay the same, but the, the key doesn't work anymore, right? Um, they change their, their interface. So... Yeah, we're gonna, it's going to be interesting to see. I'd love to hear comments on it. Any thoughts? Uh, do you have Gate 59? How do you see it play out in your life? What line do you have? And just at a global level, um, I often look to news stories to try to see kind of trends. And it's interesting. I mean, I remember some years back, there was a real... There's definitely the, the two sides of it. There's the loss of Gate 40, which makes a lot of people afraid because they go, we're losing the family bond. But then what we're gaining is Gate 59. Now, is that hookup culture? Is that what it's about? Is that Tinder and kind of order a date? I don't think so. I don't think so. That might be part of it. That might be the detriment. But the exaltation is actual true soulmate bonding, right? The exaltation is the real bond between two people that doesn't care about the circumstances. And I think that is going to be the real temple in the future.